Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Sales Online Forum 2022. The purpose of this forum is to give presentations on research categories through Zoom and have an online discussion with other participants. The participants will research on the theme related to the given category and present the results in the forum. Other participants will be able to ask questions during the Q&A session. First, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Nordanya Alisha, and I'll be serving as your moderator for this forum. Before we welcome our first presenter, here's a short outline on what our topic today is about. Our home is slowly but surely starting to deteriorate because of our selfish actions. What state will our Earth be in two decades from now? Very likely, it will be much the same as it is right now. But then, if you believe in global warming and climate change, then you must be well aware that 20 years from now, it is most likely that both polar ice caps and all the glaciers will have melted, half the population will have died of heat exposure or starvation, and so many more devastating events will occur. However, do you believe in the flip side of this predicament, which is, will we be able to help turn the tables and recover Earth? Now, we welcome our first presenter, Daniel Evan Koyonian, to give his presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Daniel Evan Koyonian. I am from SMA 10 Negeri Samarinda, and I am from Indonesia. So my presentation is about superbugs. I know it's a little different and a little off topic, but I'm trying to do something unorthodox, something that probably has never been done before. So let me begin with the introduction to superbugs. So basically superbugs are antibiotic resistant bacteria or fungi, but we will emphasize only on the bacteria. So I'm talking about in 20 years, a plague, a different plague than the coronavirus. Here are the few examples of uh, superbugs such as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and Yesera gonorrhoeae. Next is the causes of this mayhem. So first we have antibiotic overuse and overpopulation. So in case of antibiotic overuse, if someone were to use antibiotics without prescription from doctors, this will kill all the weak bacteria, leaving only the strong bacteria that can resist those type of antibiotics and amplify their numbers. Now, this is the simple analogy to it. So see that after uh, antibiotic introduction, it has adapted to the environment and now it is resistant towards antibiotics. Next is because of overpopulation. Now say that in one area, the, there are many people, it's a densely populated area. Most likely people will get sick because in overpopulated regions, the, the sanitations are poor and is cramped. So most likely you will get infected by a certain disease. And with dense populations, people will migrate elsewhere. To, but because of this migration, they are actually spreading the disease and making more people getting sick. But not only because of migration, animals are also taking antibiotics. And uh, not to mention to keep them from getting sick. People feed antibiotics onto uh, on animals. They use it on their feed, animal feed. But this actually similar to the first problem, similar to the first problem, this will only cause more bacteria, bacteria who are resistant towards antibiotics. Next, I will explain why this is a serious problem, why this can lead to extinction. So the first is because bacteria reproduce really fast and because we have poor sanitation. 
So first, uh, bacteria actually reproduce about four to 20 minutes into two cells. So, so let's say I have a bacteria cell and in just one day, that bacteria will divide itself to two to the power of 72 cells. That's over a billion cells in just one day. Now think about that. Now think about that you have been infected for a week. It'll be more than a billion, approximately about five million billion cells in just one week. Not just because bacteria is actually produced fast, but because some people just can't keep their house clean. Now there has been a swab test to see how dirty a house is. And turns out from the swap test conducted by BBC, the most dirty areas are your kitchen and your bathroom. With your uh, kitchen sponges are the most dirty ones, followed by your kitchen sinks and countertops, etc. Now, although this is, although we, it seems like we're about to extinct, but I have some solutions along with its pros and cons. So the first solution is to use antibiotics when necessary. This is actually the straightforward solution. It prevents bacteria adaptation, but antibiotics require prescription and it is less acknowledged by anybody to use antibiotics necessary. And next is to use herbal medicine. This is to boost immunity is actually easily accessible, accessible compared to antibiotics and has less side effects, but this does not kill the bacteria, this only boosts your immunity. Next is about plantful family, which is for one family to only have two children or less. So this actually controls population number, which solves the problem number two, but some people just don't see this as a good thing because some people just want to have more children. Some nations just want to increase their population number. So this may not be acceptable for everyone. And next and last is to keep your environment clean, not only by uh, throwing trash into the bin, but also cleaning your house, exercise. Those are the ways to keep your environment, not just the environment, but your body to be clean. This prevents sickness and stop bacteria growth, but at the same time, people just don't think this is the thing they want. This is just too much hassle, too much problem for them. But although we are dooming ourselves, scientists has, have developed certain technologies to prevent the plague from happening. So the first solution is to use bacteriophage treatment. So bacteriophages are viruses which hunt only bacteria. If we can genetically engineer this type of virus, we can kill the resistant bacteria without harming the good ones. Now, this is the image of a bacteriophage. It looks kind of like a nanobot, but this is a very clean and very fast solution to this problem. Next, we have genetic engineering. Okay, some bacteria are... Uh, are being spread by insects. So if we can target the insects by genetically engineer them to stop reproducing, we can control the insects number and prevent the spreading of disease, or we can genetically engineer the bacteria to prevent it from replicate, replicating itself and thus preventing the spread of disease. Now, this is a simple, image of genetically engineered insects. So this light colored one is the genetically engineered one. The notice that only one of the 100 offsprings are cap is capable of spreading the disease, but 99.9% are, uh, are sterile and cannot spread the disease. Thank you all for uh, for paying attention and thank you all for the time to present. I'm sorry if I have some mispronunciations 
And I hope you all to keep yourselves clean, to wash your hands, to uh, exercise a lot, and to don't and not forget to wear masks because just one sick person it can be a match that will set the globe on fire. Uh, yes. Uh, does anyone have any questions? All right, thank you, Daniel. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Daniel, do you mind stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Does anyone have a question they would like to put forward to Daniel? Are there any questions from the YouTube live? All right, so we have a question. Why did you choose this research topic? Daniel? Yeah, yes. That's a question. Why did you choose this research topic? Because it is unorthodox. Uh, my first thought was what will happen in 20 years on Earth, but then come, but it did came to my mind about climate change. But I think maybe I'm gonna try something out of the box, something that people often underlook, something dangerous. Because once Bill Gates said that there will be a plague, and people just don't accept the idea. But now I'm giving you another warning about another plague. And I hope you can take it to the heart and consider all of what I've just said. All right, thank you. There's another question. Since next generation technology, including genetic energy and bacterial phage treatment is mentioned, what should we do to make this technology feasible in the future? Uh, okay, to make it more feasible, uh, the government will fund more research about this technology. For the phage one, it'll be like most likely be feasible in about 20 to 25 years, right? depending on how much the government's contribution. But for the genetic engineering one, that is a debatable topic because genetic engineering can alter entire species, it can cause extinction, it has unimaginable uh, consequences. So for the genetic engineering one, I'm not really sure, but for the bacteriophage one, by government funding, by doing more research on the topic on microbiology, it'll be more feasible in the future. Right, okay, thank you. Do you have any more questions? All right, now we shall welcome our next presenter. Next up, let's welcome Yu Ziyan. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ziyan from Zhongling High School. My country of, of origin is Malaysia. And my research topic is the forest deforestation and, and how to stop it. 
So please allow me to share my screen. Okay, so I will start on my presentation on my research topic, which is the first destruction and how to stop it. So um, there, I will focus on three aspects uh, in this huge topic. The first one is the reason behind the first destruction and the sequences of the first destruction. And the last one, is the action that can be taken by different parties to stop this forest destruction. Um, this aspect could be helpful for us to understand, have a brief understand on what forest destruction is and what action could we take to stop it. So I'll start with the reason behind the forest destruction. So the first reason is illegal and unsustainable logging. So as we know that timber is widely used in production of furniture, paper product, and construction. And so the um, demand of the timber in global market is high. So um, there are some um, people willing to um, lock the lock the forest and clear the forest for timber. Uh, since it, it can uh, high profit, it could be gained from the um, on the trade of the timber in international market. So the forests are made, mainly cut to provide uh, materials such as timber to the uh, to fulfill the needs of the global market on it. So the second one is the forest fire. So the forest fire could be caused by many reasons. Um, it could be categorized into two main groups. So the first group is the human activity, such as arson, which is intentionally set up fire by human. And the overheat power line. So this is the example of the first group. And the second group is the natural disaster, including dry climate and the lightning which strike on the dry uh, woods and cause forest fire. And the third reason is mining activities. So the, the, there are various industries in the world that uh, high, have a high demand in rare, mat rare metal, such as um, electronics, which uh, require a lot of lithium and platinum and gold, silver and copper to uh, for produce electronics products. So the forest is cleared to provide space for mining activities so it could be carried out and the forests are usually just cut down and to provide the space for the mining activities. And the last one is the conversion of forest for agricultural purpose. So as we know that the human population is increased and there are switch of diet um, emphasized on um, different type of diet and thus there are more agriculture, uh, there are more farmland is needed to fulfill the demand of the increasing, increasing human population, thus there are more forests being cut down and convert and convert to agriculture land by planting uh, economical agriculture products such as soy and palm oil to uh, fulfill the demand of the uh, increasing population. And so I will enter the consequences of forest destruction. So the first consequences of forest destruction is the increase in soil erosion. So it's a negative cycle. So as we know that forests have, trees in forests have 
roots that anchor the soil to prevent it being swept away or washed away by the rainwater. So when the forest is cleared for agricultural purpose and replaced by agricultural plants, which cannot, which their roots cannot hold onto the soil to prevent soil being washed away. So when there are huge rain, the soil is swept into the river and the fertile soil is washed away and the original land will become less fertile and more forest is cleared again for more fertile land. So it's a negative cycle. And if we don't stop it, it will just continue to keep cycling. And the second one is increase in greenhouse gas emission. So first act as carbon sink because it um, carry out photosynthesis, um, absorb um, carbon dioxide and release oxygen gas in the process. And the first is cut down and the, and it's uh, the product of the tree, which is timber, is burned as fuel. So the carbon inside the tree, which is stored inside the tree, is released in form of carbon dioxide. So there are more, the concentration of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere will increase and which cause the rise in temperature and the increase of frequency of extreme weather and change in pattern of weather. We do can feel these changes in weather in, uh, of, in recent decades. And the destruction of forests will also reduce the biodiversity. So more than three quarter of four of world land species can be found in forests. So when we kill forests, this flora and fauna will lose their habitats. So without habitats, how come they can keep surviving? So uh, the endless species may be extinct and we could never see them again. So what could we do to stop this forest destruction? So as uh, ordinary people, just like us, we could start with buying forest-friendly products. So the following certifications are the products that certified by several uh, government body, uh, such as the Rainforest Alliance and the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil and the Forest Stewardship Council. So these products are uh, regulated by certified body and to ensure that the process of production of product is uh, friendly to the forest. So we also can recycle the paper products. So in Malaysia, uh, we depose the paper products into the blue color um, recycling bin. So the color of color a recycling bin may be different in different country. And we can, besides, uh, besides we, Besides, we so the recycled product uh, could be processed into brand new products as it the material is same, which is the fiber from the timber, the tree. So that's last last tree will be cut down for the um to fulfill the demand of the timber as we have the already supplied a uh, recycled paper products to fulfill their demand. And besides that, um, we could be we could make additional income by selling these paper products to recycling dealers. And we also can for the government, uh, we the government should reinforce the law. So there are several government agencies and law enacted in Malaysia. So in Malaysia, we have the Ministry of Energy, Green, Green Technology and Water. 
and the Department of Wildlife and National Park Peninsula Malaysia, Perhilitan. So the Perhilitan is majorly responsible for the national parks uh, conservation and wildlife conservation. And, for, and we also have the Forest Department of Peninsula Malaysia. And that's various law related to the environment passed in the Malaysia, such as the Akta Quality Alam Sekalilin Sembilan Pulo Tujuh Pulo Empat. So this is the Environmental Quality Act 1974. So this uh, law is uh, mainly regulate the pollution of the environment. So it's a bit unrelated. However, the second one is closely related to the deforestation, which is the Akta Perhutanan Negara 984, which is National Forestry Law 1984. So this is the law that uh, regulates the administration, management, and conservation of the forest in Malaysia. And the NGOs, which is the non-government organization and the government could carry out various activity to increase the awareness among the society towards the deforestation, such as this forum. Okay. So uh, various campaign could be carried out, such as talk and forum, um, discussion, and educational tour. This activity could change the mindset of the society on this issue and, are, and maybe could be could enlighten um, young minds to um, brainstorming the solution for this issue. So thank you for your attention and time. That's all from my end. Is there any questions for me? All right, thank you, Zian. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Does anyone want to ask a question to him? All right, we have one. Due to rising agricultural demand, do you think it's justifiable to conduct deforestation, even though after that the land would be used to grow greens. Um, the increase in agriculture demand is a fact. So we can't just, um, sorry, could you please present the questions? Um, okay, so I'll continue. So the, the agriculture increase in agriculture demand is a fact. So we could not solve it just by cutting more first. We could improve the efficiency of our agriculture um, process by such as the agri um, the hydroponic, which is um, growing the agriculture plant by using water as the medium, or we could increase our agriculture technology by, by culture tissue cultivating, which enable we to um, produce agricultural products in the laboratory, which don't require, which not require a huge space uh, for it to grow. Um, have I um, answered your question? All right, thank you so much. We have another question. What are your thoughts on the efforts being made so far by the government to reduce deforestation so in my <coughs> sorry so in my opinion the government um, have had done a huge effort to stop the deforestation so th there's a ngo which support by the government which is the club Alam, which is the um, environmental club yeah so it carried out a lot of the activities to um increase the awareness of the young people, especially secondary students, uh, towards this problem by having uh, such as the fun day camp in the forest. You can have a tour in the forest um, to understand about how the forest ecosystem works. And we also um, promote various 
um, efforts such as the recycling and recycling of paper products. So there are um, recycling bins set out in each school so the paper products could be recycled regularly. And there are also, um, for government side, there are also the forest rangers to um, to patrol and to enforce the law if there are illegal logging, logging occurs. All right, we have one more question from Daniel. What must world leaders do to prevent forest destruction other than enforcing the law? If income for national growth is from the industrial sector, which they are the ones who destroys the forest? Um, Um, I, in my opinion, the forest destruction is should be have a balance. So we could uh, have gain a balance between the forest uh, the forest destruction for industrial need and the forest conservation. So we could um, the industrial may have a high demand in the um, forest in the natural materials such as timber so we can carry out um, sustainable um, logging such by doing by cutting by planting the tree the not the at the equal number of tree cut by us and we plant the tree in the forest so that um, the total amount of the forest will not change even though we, uh, we Con we um, could have the supply of the timber continuously. All right, thank you. Are there any more questions? We have another one. In your opinion, how and why are people nowadays more aware on the destruction of trees more than ever? Uh, so in my opinion, this is because um, the effect or the consequences of forest destruction that I've mentioned before is become more significant recently. So we can note that there are increase in temperature, especially recently in the London, there are freaking records. So the greenhouse gas also become concentration of Greenhouse gas also become higher, and the air pollution, the oxygen content in the atmosphere also decrease due to there's not there's less tree to carry out photosynthesis. So, I think the effect is significant and obvious. So, the since it's the effect is more more obvious. So we I think we can, uh, the people were more aware on this problem. All right, thank you again, Zian. Now we will have our next presentation. A warm welcome to Engjin Biamba. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Engjin and I am from Mongolia. I'm currently studying at Chinmangat High School. And so to, um, please allow me to share my screen. Um, so today I'm going to talk about global warming, but uh, focused on the rise in sea level. So uh, I think first I need to talk about why I chose this topic. Yeah, right now most people are talking about global warming and it's like every day's issue. We are talking about it like it becomes like a cliche, but still it is one of the most major problems in, we are now facing in the earth right now. And also one of the reasons why I chose this is because Mongolia has no ocean border. We only have a ground border. That's why in Mongolia, um, not very much people uh, know about rising sea level. They don't have like a knowledge, enough understanding about this. That's why um, if I researched this and if I talked about 
this uh, on this forum and also for my Mongolian friends, I can raise event. I thought I can raise awareness on this topic. So today's agenda is um, first one is the cause of the sea level rise and sea level 20 years from now. And what can we do? And the, lastly, we will do conclusion. So what is cause of uh, sea level rise? Firstly, uh, melting glaciers um, and then the thermal expansion. And because of this, uh, there will be a sea level rise. And this all things uh, causes the global warming, but this um, sea level rise is just one thing that um, caused the global warming. And there are a lot of things um, that causes uh, the global warming, for example, um, greenhouse gas emissions, consuming too much and deforestation. And, but today um, um, I, I want to remind you that I am focusing on the sea level rise. So um, in sea level rise, the 45% of it's um, from the melting glaciers and 38% from it's the thermal expansion and 12, 13% of it's a melting Antarctic ice sheet and 4% of it's um, ice loss from the Greenland. So um, some of you might in, um, interested or like get interested in what is thermal expansion. Uh, thermal expansion is the tendency of matter to change in volume uh, to a change in volume in response to a change in temperature. Um, so uh, simply put in, if the global temperature rise um, higher and higher in every year, um, the thermal expansion becomes faster. Yeah, and the melting glaciers look like this. So uh, sea level 20 years from now. So first of all, before I talk about uh, 20 years from now, I think we need to know the difference between local sea and global sea. Um, I thought some of the people um, don't know the difference between it. And they thought that uh, in, the, in my country, like um, we don't have enough like sea because um, the level of our sea is decreasing but how they are like increasing. So the difference, um, the major difference between this is um, global sea level is the global average of height in the ocean surface relative to the earth center. And the local sea level is the height of the ocean relative to the land along the coastline. And one is measured from the space and one, one is measured from their local. And the global sea level is affected by the global rise in temperatures, and it is rising uh, since the 19th century. And the local is uh, affected by the global processes, local tectonic activity and ocean currents and other factors. And it is a local sea level is rise happening rapidly in some places and more slowly in others. So um, some facts, um, the temperature uh, risen by um, risen by more than 1.1 Celsius degrees uh, since 1900s, uh, which is a major, um, which is, it's a major number for us, for the earth. And, the, and since the uh, 1880 um, to today, um, the sea level is, has, has risen by like 21 to 24 centimeters and for the next uh, 20 to 30 years, it will rise um, 30 centimeters, which uh, is the, which uh, you can see the major problem from this. Um, the sea level um, risen by uh, 20 centimeters in 200 years, but just in 30 years, it is predicted to rise, rise by um, 30 centimeters, which is very crazy and it is it shows how it is dangerous and let me uh, take an example on this and it's a Shanghai China in 2012 a report from a team of UK and Dutch scientists declared Shanghai has most vulnerable uh, vulnerable uh, major city in the world to serious flooding and based on the factors such as numbers of um, people living in close to coast coastline and about 26 million people will be displaced by rising sea level 
rising waters of global temp temperatures increased by three Celsius. And in this photo, you can see the uh, 20 and 50 prediction almost uh, 20 years, uh, 30 years from now. And it is uh, when Shanghai two degrees Celsius rise, it almost looked like, uh, like drowning in some area. So, and Shanghai is here in China. So, and the older projections for 2050, the Shanghai was looking like this uh, for the predicted one. And it is almost like the same as now. It, it is less harmful than now today uh, in the old projection. But in the new projection, this looking like this, which is um, which shows this uh, global warming, this risen temperature is getting like more harder to cut. Yeah. And I think uh, it will be um, interesting if I show you on this on Google Ma Earth map. So here is it. It's um, Shanghai, China. If, the, if there is Hausa, two Celsius of warming. And this is Shanghai, China. If there will be um, four Celsius of warming. Um, it seems that Shanghai will be um, drowned if there will be a four Celsius degree rise. So, and next. Okay, this is the coastal flood flooding in uh, um, 2100. 20, yeah, so this will look like this and the whole place drowned. So it, this shows um, if the global temperature rise, the too many, like too much population, most of the population in the world will be disappear, might be um, dead, or we don't have to, we don't have enough land to the people uh, of like 10 billion people or something like that. And but by the 2050, the 800 million people will be affected by the sea level rise. Um, it is the fact, I think this will be interesting fact for you. And what can we do? So I included this example. I included this um, this little part of a mag garden magazine. Uh, it is the Shanghai's um, solution for their uh, flooding. They had they built the China's largest deep water drainage system. And why I um, chose this one is because I think they the Shanghai is doing like the protection from the flooding, protection from the, um, to simply put in the global warming to just like temporary protection. They just do the temporary protection, but I think they don't do like um, the thing that lasts forever, the last longer than the temporary one. So I um, included this one. And the world in the worldwide, um, people develop the sustainable development goals. And in the, in this one, uh, the third, uh, 13, which is the climate action, included everything that uh, can prevent from the uh, global warming situation. And it's the goal is to uh, take urgent action to combat the climate change and its impact. And it's include uh, the Paris Agreement and everything um, and on, on this. And uh, every country on this uh, goal agreement um, they um, promised them, promised each other to not to increase the global temperature uh, above two, two degrees Celsius. So what can we do now? Um, for us, we can save energy at home and electricity is powered by the coal, oil, gas. And that's why if we use renewable energy more, we can produce less uh, greenhouse gas emissions and we can walk, cycle or pu take public transportation. And there are like around 1 billion, 446 billion cars. So that's why if we like take transportation, public transportation, um, we can reduce the great number of uh, cars that produce greenhouse gases. The la and also there is, um, we can use the reduce, reuse and recycle. This is one of the most important uh, one we can do. 
and to protect our climate, buy, we can buy fewer things or we can shop for the second hand, repair what we can have and recycle what we have. Uh, also, um, additionally, we have to speak up. We have to sleep, speak up like we did in the forum to the um, to the world and to our classmates. We can start by little and this is healthy for you and also healthy for the earth. And my conclusion, uh, one problem, one small problem causes earth too many uh, uh, like problems uh, to face the earth to face the catastrophe. But there are many problems caused by global warming. If we don't take actions, at least on one problem right now, we will destroy the everything that we that is living with us. Therefore, we don't need just talking about it. And I think we need like proper actions. So here are my resources. And thank you for your attention. And let's save the Earth because it's the only planet with a pizza. And that was the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that amazing presentation, Anshin. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Does anyone have a question they would like to put forward to Anshin? Hi, I would like to ask a question, but first, thank you for the very informative presentation. My question is that, what do you think the developed countries need to do in order to prevent from drowning? Um, hi, Joshua, and thank you for your question. And I think um, now the developing countries are like, oh, we have to like, in order to make money, they are like doing really, really bad things for our earth. And, and they like think it's like stopping the climate change is like very uh, like hard thing to do. And they're reflected very hard on them. But I think they, the government just need to do uh, to educate them, educate the children to stop this, educate the children to uh, recycle, reduce, or you, we, they can just um, uh, teach the nationwide to how to reduce. Because in Mongolia, we don't have like recycling thing. Uh, we just throw the everything in the one box and we just throw it away. But if we can fix that, it will be like in, in Mongolia, we have uh, 3 million people. So the 3 million people, uh, everyone can recycle. Everyone can, um, if everyone learn to recycle, uh, it will be like very huge impact on the uh, earth's uh, climate change. So I think it will be better to start from the, um, start from the small things and then the bigger things. All right, thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Um, yes, I have a question. Okay, so um, you have your solutions, but to think about it, those solutions are theoretical because this will only work if everyone have self-awareness about the rising sea level. So, do you have any solutions if people will only take this problem seriously once it is already too late? Thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a very nice question. Yeah, I think, well, we are now, <laughs> start. it's like educating people and like speaking up is one of the solution and well, we can be late, but we are now growing up. We are now understanding this situation. Uh, we can speak up, we can like, yeah, we can raise awareness before it's too late because there is a hope. And um, honestly, before everything, like people can change before everything um, is late. I think there will be, in everything, there will be like hope because no one uh, wants to like, um, destroy their home and no one wants to um, leave their home like this so I think people will starting to like um, understand this situation so I can't say like I will I don't know um, maybe there there can be like it can be like late but I don't think like it is too late to like stop this situation or something like that and I hope you like I hope that I answered your question 
Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Are there any more questions? All right, we have one question here. Given that 71% of greenhouse gas emissions come from large corporations, don't you think large corporations should be targeted in the solutions rather than putting the burden on the masses? Yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, I think so. But on my presentation, I, I, I mostly do the things that we can do. But like, yeah, for the government, uh, and for the like the bigger um, co corporations, they should be stopped. And I think they are now stopping, like starting to stop, like reducing their amount of gas emissions because we already like agreed with on the Paris Agreement agreement and also um, the SDG. Um, so I think they are like stopping right now. But they like they really really have to like. Um, make their change their like method of like manufacturing things into like eco friendly thing. So, in order to like let them do this, um, I think the government, the other people, right now really have to do this. And for us, like for the teenagers like us, um, it is like very major. It's a hard problem for us, but we still have to do our best to um, like fight for this thing. All right, thank you so much. Does anyone else have a question? If not, we will take a short five minute break. All right, no questions. Now we shall take a short five minute break. Our next presentation will start at 3.58.
And welcome back. Let's enthusiastically welcome our fourth presenter, Joshua Rahul Ro. Hi everyone, my name is Joshua Rahul Ro, and my country of origin is Malaysia. Currently, I am studying at SMK Lasal PJ, and my research topic for today is climate of the future. Please allow me to share my screen. So this is a table of contents for my presentation today. Firstly, I'll be talking about climate change and the causes and effects of climate change and the solution that we can take as a society. What is climate change? Climate change is the increase in Earth's temperature and the shift in weather patterns. And it's also known as global warming. Global warming is caused by the burning of fossil fuels that generates greenhouse gases. It acts like a blanket wrapped around the earth, trapping the sun's heat and raising temperature. You may ask, how is global warming? How does climate change occur? This phenomenon actually traps heat and light from the sun in Earth's atmosphere, which causes the increase in the temperatures of Earth. This is a few gases, greenhouse gases that we know. Firstly is carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. Carbon dioxide is usually emitted by factories, whereas methane is usually from livestock. Next is what is the causes and effects of climate change? Climate change can be caused by many things. Firstly is deforestation and tree clearing. Each year, approximately 12 million hectares of forests are destroyed. 12 million hectares is almost equivalent to the size of Spain. Plants and trees play an important role in regulating the climate because they absorb carbon dioxide from the air and release oxygen back into it. Forests and bushlands act as carbon sinks, as they are valuable at keeping the global warming to a 1.5 degree Celsius. Next is transportation. For example, cars, planes, and ferries. The burning of fossil fuels like gasoline and diesel releases carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere. Road vehicles account for the largest part. This is because due to the combustion of petroleum-based products. Even in our own country, we can experience the amount of cars on the road. Now imagine this scenario is happening all around the world every day. Transportation accounts for nearly one quarter of global warming-related emissions and, tends to, and trend points to a significant increase in the coming years as the global population increases. Next is the industrial activities and manufacturing. Since the Industrial Revolution, humans have been burning fossil fuels, such as coal and petroleum for energy, which releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As we know, carbon dioxide can be really detrimental to the atmosphere. A quarter of this is for heat and electricity while the rest is for industrial processes and transportation. Next is overpopulation. Population growth along with the increased consumption tends to lead to the increased emission of climate changing greenhouse gases. A rapid population growth worsens the impact of climate change by straining its resources. Overpopulation exposes more people to climate-related risks, especially in low-income regions. For example, we can see a place called the Sahil in the continent of Africa. The rising temperatures in the Sahil is 1.0 times faster than the global average. Scientists project to a temperature increase of 3 to 5 degrees Celsius by 2050 and as much as 8 degrees Celsius by 2000. 
As a result, increasing and frequent droughts and floods threaten to further impair food production in a region where over 80% of farmland, farmland is already degraded and growing population are shrinking available pasture lands. Next is the consequences of global warming and climate change. Firstly, is temperatures will continue to rise. There will be more droughts and heat waves all around the world. Droughts in the southern and heat waves everywhere are projected to become more intense and cold waves less everywhere. The Arctic is also likely to become ice-free, expected to become essentially ice-free by 2100. The global sea levels has been raised about eight inches since the record began in the 18th century. Next is the unpredictable weather patterns. Destructive storms and have become more intense and more frequent in many regions. As temperature rises, more moisture evaporates, which exacerbates the extreme rainfall and flooding, causing more natural disasters. The frequency and extent of tropical storms is also affected by the warming ocean. Cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons feed on warm waters as the ocean surface. Such storms often destroy homes and communities, causing death and a huge economic loss. Next is poverty and displacement. Climate change increases the factors that put and keep people in poverty. Floods may sweep away urban slums, destroying homes and livelihoods. Heat can make it difficult to work in outdoor jobs. Water scarcity may affect crops, and most refugees from countries that are most vulnerable and least ready to adapt to the impacts of climate change might be affected the most. Next is the loss of biodiversity and the destruction of our ecosystem. Climate change poses the risk of survival of species in the ocean and on land. This risk increases the temperature climb. Forest fire and extreme weather, diseases among many threats the, re the related of climate change. Some species will even become extinct and will try to relocate to survive but others, not due to their limited adaptability, might wither off and die. Nevertheless, we as humans too will slowly be extinct, extinct, just like plants and animals. This also causes economic consequences to our countries. Agricultural losses cost billions of dollars in damages, and money is needed to treat and control the spread of diseases. Next. What are the solutions to stop climate change? There are two main solutions that I've researched about. Firstly is green technology and policy making. For green te technology, there are five major technology that have been found. Firstly is hydropower. Hydropower is currently the largest producer of energy accounting for over 70% of our renewable energy sources. The way it works is by the special installations where strong currents of water will push through a mechanical instrument to produce energy. Next is solar power. Solar energy is the most abundant energy resources and is even harnessed in cloudy weather. The rate at which solar energy is intercepted by the earth is about 10,000 times greater than the rate which humankind consumes energy. This is actually a lot of energy produced by just solar power alone. Solar powers can be used anywhere and everywhere, as it can be used in homes and solar power plants. Next is wind power. The key to wind power is to place the energy generators at high altitudes where the wind velocity is very high. Although average, spin, average wind speeds may vary considerably, considerably by location, many parts of the world have strong winds. 
But the best location for generating wind powers at times are the remote ones. Offshore wind powers offer tremendous potential wind powers is the most cost efficient than solar power. Next is geothermal energy. Geothermal isn't applicable everywhere, but it is but the amount of energy generated by it can be very substantial. Geothermal energy utilizes the accessible thermal energy from the Earth's interior. Heat is extracted from the geothermal reservoirs using wells and other means. Once on the surface, the fluids of various temperature will generate electricity. This form of generation of electricity is actually very efficient in cool and Nordic countries. Lastly is biomass. Biomass is the conversion of manufacturing byproducts, such as wood chips, leftover sugar, animal nature, and anything else that is burnable. This includes materials that are specifically for production of energy, like corn and ethanol. Biomass is burned and the heat energy is turned into electricity. Nevertheless, energy created by burning biomass creates greenhouse gases emission too, but at lower levels than burning fossil fuels like coal and oil. However, bioenergy should only be used in limited applications, given potential negative environmental effects. Now I'll be talking about the ways we can fight climate change. Firstly, is by policy making. We should vote more green politicians into the office and politicians that keep their mandates and do not stray away from protecting the environment when in office. As we saw in the 2017, President Donald Trump decided to pull out the United States from the Paris Agreement, which pleads to set off global framework and change climate change by limiting the global warming to a two degree Celsius. Nevertheless, after the 2021 election, he was voted out. One of the reasons was because he decided to come out from the Paris Agreement. You might be asking what we as youths can do to change this narrative. Firstly, we should always be aware to the things that are happening around us that concerns the environment and our well-being. We should also voice out our opinions with boldness, whether it's small in our school or big at a global scale. If there is still no apparent changes, we as citizens have the right to vote and we should exercise it by voting green leaders who are trustworthy and act and can execute their mandates. Secondly, is that we can support greener companies. Companies like Star Apple, Starbucks, Honda, and many more can drastically cause an impact to climate change. For example, Apple has taken the step to become carbon neutral across their corporate operations by the year 2030. Their aim is to make products using only reusable energy sources and recycled materials. Thus, they, pro they prioritize responsible source and recover materials that have been recycled. Moreover, in 2021, Honda has announced their key targets for sale of electrical vehicles with a plan to make more battery electric battery electric cars and fuel cell electric vehicles to represent 100% of its vehicle sales by 2040, progressing from the sales 40% by 2030 and 80% by 2035, which means they are planning to sell a lot of more, they are planning to focus their cars more to electric and battery using cars. If we supported more green companies, which prioritize climate change, the demand of greener items will increase, which in return might force other companies to follow suit 
and grow towards a more sustainable earth. Next is I believe that our government should properly implement the laws regarding climate change. Lawmakers should be more vigilant and stricter when enacting laws regarding climate change. Many research has pointed out that there are many laws to protect our environment, but the total execution is not at par with the law. This causes a lot of large companies to misuse and abuse the law as it is not strict and rarely enforced. The government and involved organizations should impose higher tax rates for companies which produce a lot of trash yearly. Furthermore, they should also fine companies who breach environmental laws and pollute the environment. In recent years, the government all across the globe have been trying to take actions against climate change, but it is not enough. Finally, I would like to thank everyone for listening to my presentation. I hope you have learned something new today. All of us must do our part to prevent climate change and to ensure Earth has a brighter future in the two decades from now. Everyone in the world should set aside our differences and work together to overcome this issue before it gets too late and there is no turning back. Thank you for listening. That's all from me. All right. Thank you so much for that very insightful presentation, Joshua. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask Joshua? Um, yeah, I have a question for Joshua. And I think this question may be not related that not that related to the green technology, but in the future, like Earth population uh, will be uh, will still be rising, and the demand of manufacturing goods will increase. Like which means uh, the two main causes of the climate change will increase. So, do you think like countries uh, need to like decrease the number of birth, um, even though they are like using the green technology, the people will be, like still be rising. So, do you think? Uh, they need to decrease the rate of the birth. Thank you for that question. So yes, I do think they need country need to control their birth rates to avoid overpopulation, but they should not do it very harshly. Personally, we have seen a few countries implementing regulations that are very harsh on birth rates. For example, we can take China with its one-child policy which is limited to only one children per family. I believe this law is actually quite harsh on the people because it limits them from having a family. But actually research has showed that it actually benefited China a lot, economically and, and socially. But morally, it has caused a lot of bad cases, such as the abandonment of children and the unregistered, unregistered children. In conclusion, I think every country should educate their future generations on overpopulation to prevent it. I hope that answers your question. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, since there are no more questions, let's move on to the next presenter. Now let's have our next presenter, New Hiran, to start his presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. So my name is Hiran from Victoria Institution, Kuala Lumpur. And please allow me to share my screen. So as you can see here, my topic is on policymaking and climate change, right? Policy, policies are basically cogs of society. You know, without policies, we cannot function in a way that is efficient. So guidelines and rules has to be made in order for everyone you know, with a united vision to move forward and progress to newer and better things. Now, the reason I chose policymaking and climate change together was because climate change is an issue, right? And I think all of us share the same vision to sort of mit to mitigate it, 
basically you know because we deserve a good future we deserve a future that we can that we want to live in you know so i believe that through good policy making it is possible you know to save our earth from impending doom which i will be explaining now so ever since the industrial revolution the earth's temperature has risen you know about about 1 degree celsius since pre-industrial levels now this number is projected to jump you know in the next by the end of this century uh, based on you know our car, our current car, our, our current carbon emissions scientists are projected that our earth's temperature is going to rise around 3 degrees celsius which is significantly higher and exponentially higher compared to what it is the past 150 years ago so this exponential rise is going to cause many problems you know things like our ecosystem dying you know especially trees here in the equator you know the, through millions of years of evolution they are adapted you know through you know very moist climate you know constant rainfall but what the rising temperature would do is that it would throw this you know it would basically catch these trees off guard you know and because these trees aren't well suited you know to drier conditions you know, they're going to wilt you know and eventually the the soil is going to get less fertile you know and all the forest is going to become a wasteland very soon like sahara next we also have you know we have to worry you know about the melting ice caps you know that is one of the biggest impending dooms that is facing us in the next 20 30 years you know countries like los cities like los angeles San Francisco, Bangkok are all at risk, you know, of being submerged underwater. The Jakarta government has also made efforts, you know, to has also made precautionary efforts to they so basically Indonesia moved their capital from Jakarta to Kalimantan recently because they knew that in the next 20 years Jakarta is going to be submerged underwater. So the countries are very clear that okay, we're going to we're going to be submerged, so let's move. Next is, you know, of course, you know, more heat waves, you know, and more cold winters. You know, this is going to severely impact our food supply, you know, our food chain from, you know, producing wheat, rice, you know, our sugar canes, bamboo, all of these things are going to be severely affected. And through that, you know, we're going to have a global food supply shortage, which isn't beneficial and isn't going to help anyone in the future. You know, with all of the you know large migration that's gonna happen, you know, inflations, you know, people not having enough money to buy things, you know, this is all going to result in this global catastrophe. Now, before I move on, you know, it takes, I think that you know it is fair, you know, that we deserve a voice, you know. I wouldn't say that it isn't our fault that environments like this today. You know, it has been years and years of technological advancements you know through a lot of through a lot of uh, efforts from our past scientists to get where we are today you know the fact that we're having this meeting here today proves that you know we can have this online which means that you know all our technological advances mean something but you know through all of these future implications you know we might be overwhelmed and i am frankly very overwhelmed before i even started into this research i was I wouldn't say that I wasn't aware of climate change, but that I didn't really, I couldn't really connect the dots, you know, from, okay, from the rising global temperatures, like what's going to happen to us in the future. But now that, you know, I've read a lot of things, you know, I feel fearful for my future. And I think that, you know, for us to solve this problem, of course, you know, I won't provide a very good solution, but I think it is fair for us to look in history first and see that, okay, what have we done in our past so that we can try to implement that now. So, but this isn't the first time, you know, we have encountered such a global catastrophe. So the Montreal Protocol was enacted in, 1980, in the 1980s when basically um, scientists discovered a hole, you know, above Antarctica. This hole is a, this hole is basically a hole in our ozone layer Basically, O3 molecules that has been that has been dissociated, and what causes this is the emissions of CFCs. Now, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, are vastly used in cooling agents, in hairsprays, 
all of these things. So a lot of these gases that went up into the atmosphere basically destroyed our ozone layer. Basically, O3 molecules that you know, block out the UV rays from the sun. Now, the UN said, okay, so scientists basically said, okay, the problem is how are we going to present this problem to the world? We know that this is a threat. We know that this is a very damning problem and it can cause very, very substantial change. So how are we gonna present this problem you know, to the governments and to the people? Now, I think what the, one of the merits of the Montreal Protocol was that it was very clear on what it wanted to achieve. You know, in contrast to a lot of these climate policies today, which are more vague you know, and more unspecific and really it's a long-term you know, progress thing, the Montreal Protocol was straightforward. It basically said that it recognized that okay, these substances are causing harm to our atmosphere and that, and that you know, we're going to slowly phase out you know, the use of these substances you know, from commercial use. And it worked. You know, in, by, the 19, by 1997, around only Africa and China has been, you know, it's not using, it's still using CFCs. So basically, most of the world has transitioned from CFC to other alternatives like HCFCs, HFCs. Now, these are, these are just some few key takeaways from the Montreal Protocol. So the first thing is that, you know, the Montreal Protocol was personal in a sense that the people could feel, you know, that this was a real problem and it was going to affect them personally. So, you know, skin cancer, right? You know, UV rays from the sun, skin cancer, well, it goes hand in hand, right? Next, that it was very perceptible, you know? The Montreal Protocol was, you know, when it first hit the news, you know, everyone panicked. You know, even Cold War that was going on at the time, you know, it was, the, the, the war was even, you know, sort of brought back, you know, and the issue of um, the issue of the CFC emissions were brought into the spotlight. So people were really well aware of this problem. Now, in stark contrast to today, yes, you know, climate change has really caused you know, a lot of personal, you know, and people could really see it. People could really see it happening. But I think a lot of problems that you know, has been presented to us today does not have very practical solutions. Now, in the Montreal Protocol, that wasn't the case. The Montreal Protocol was clear in it wanted, what it, on what it wanted to achieve. It basically said that, okay, in a short 10-year period of time, we're going to slowly phase out CFC use, you know, and basically that's going to help our atmosphere, right? That's going to solve the problem. But no, the, the problems that, that the faces today is that you know, we know that the increasing temperature is going to cause... Um, is going to cause climate change, but we don't really have a really practical way to solve it. Now, now let's look at some modern solutions, right? What are some of the more, um, more recent efforts that have been made you know, to counter climate change? Now, in 2016, um, the, the, prim, the, the Paris Climate Accord was signed by 195 nations that basically said that, okay, climate change is really, it's really coming, so we need to take action quick. So the goal of the, climate, the Paris Climate Agreement was to keep global temperature above two degrees from current levels. So they're basically trying to maintain la, that two degree fluctuations you know, in the next 50 years. So how does the you know, Paris, how does this agreement work, right? So the agreement is sorted out into, few, into a few, into few things, but I think the more important ones are the NDCs, which are the nationally uh, the national determined contributions. Now, NDCs are basically are basically promises and goals that are made that is listed out in a paper. You can find it on Google by each country, and it's sent to the UN to to be analyzed and to basically say, okay, we're gonna do these things in the next few years, and we're gonna see how it goes. Now, the one of the merits of NDCs are that. You know, it recognizes that each country, you know, contributed differently to climate change. And what they can do to solve climate change is also different. So it recognizes that every country has to do different things. Like just imagine if, let's say, the UN come up with some climate policy that is legally binding. That basically says that, okay, by the next quarter, every country needs 
to phase out um, need to lower carbon emissions by 0.2%. And if countries don't make it, well, they're going to face consequences, you know, fines maybe. But it's not realistic. You know, we need to have, you know, we need to burn fossil fuels you know, in order to keep this world running. You know, and to, to, sudden have, to suddenly have such a you know, change in our use of carbon isn't fair to a lot of countries. So the UN proposed this solution as, like a, as, as a good alternative, in my opinion. But I think it lacks a few things, which I'll go into later. The next is how the UN is tracking the country's progress. Now, through the Climate Action Tracker, um, countries are evaluated based on, okay, how much... So the UN would basically look into the country and say, that, okay, how much is the government funding you know, for climate programs? How much is... How much are the governments, you know, how are the governments Im implementing policies, you know, to the people, you know, and overall in their NDCs, are they doing enough to stop climate change? Now, through these five little, you know, checkboxes, you know, which I think are kind of nice, only two countries so far has been in this green zone, which are just two countries in Africa. In 2019, um, Saudi and the US were were ranked as critically insufficient. Basically, what they're doing was what, what they're doing wasn't enough. And if they keep, you know, doing if they keep covering emissions at these levels, the country, the world is gonna go, you know, the temperature is gonna continue to rise. So one of the problems with the NDCs is that it isn't legally binding. You know, people, so when these documents are submitted to the UN, there's no way for the UN to sort of enforce you know, these countries to meet their NDCs. So the, so the US could say, well, I, would want, so I want to be carbon, carbon neutral by 2050. And if when 2050 comes and the US isn't carbon, carbon neutral, they're gonna, you know, the UN has no rights, has no grounds to sort of enforce them to meet these goals. And I think this gives a lot of leeways, you know, for, for, a lot of, for a lot of oil rich countries that are still burning a lot of fuel. So, but in contrast to the Montreal Protocol, which, which was just now, the Montreal Protocol, on the other hand, is legally binding, which means that of the, of the um, terms stated in, stated and agreed upon by the signatories have to be followed. So basically, if you don't follow it, well, you're going to have some consequences, which the current, um, current framework does not implement. Now, another problem with a lot of these, you know, long-term plans is that they are, they are really long, you know. We're in, we're, we're in 2022 now, and Europe is basically saying that by 2050, we are going to be carbon neutral. Now, what does that even mean? You know, like, through this, like, 40 years period, 30 years period, you know, they're not even going to sort of enforce their way. Long-term plans, they are, I would say it's, it's, like, it's like keeping the problem at bay, you know. It's, it's not solving the problem, but it's like, it's like giving hope to people. These long-term plans, they aren't very, they are very vague, you know, as to how they are to achieve their goals. Like, they don't really pr provide any framework, you know, or any practical solutions to how they're going to achieve these goals. The same goes with Russia's plan, you know. Putin announced that in the in, in the uh, in the COP26 that Russia was going to be was going to be carbon neutral by 2060. But so far, you know, Russia has still been burning oil, selling oil, you know, really quickly. So of these plans, well, we have to see, but hopefully that you know these long-term plans are made. Now, another problem with our current with you know with the climate problem now is that they are really the, the solutions are really unpractical in a sense that transitioning to, transitioning to more cleaner energy is hard. Now, we burn you know, carbon-based energies on a daily basis, right? You know, to provide electricity for my house, there's a factory maybe around four kilometers away that is burning natural gases to provide me with the electricity you know, to continue life. So for countries to, to, sort of, to keep the world running, the world has to continue to burn carbon fuels. And without, a, without you know, changing the main source of energy to something else, we're going to be stuck in this constant loop of relying on carbon, energy, carbon, 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 
carbon-based energies. Now, I think a good way to sort of solve this is that the UN has to somehow come up with some framework for like a global building of some um, from green energy infrastructure. Because if we rely too much on, on carbon-based on carbon energies now, by the time where maybe it's 20, 30 years time, where our temperature is going is skyrocketing to the point where you know, burning you know, a little bit more is going to cause big changes. That process of transition is going to be really hard. So I think, the, especially the UN, we sh they should um, come up with some sort of framework you know, to build these infrastructures and fund them. Now, when we speak about the issue of funding, I think we cannot forget about you know, how this problem came to be. You know, historically speaking, um, developed nations now like Europe, like in Europe or the US, you know, they're all, they're all, they're all in their, in their, they're all developed now because that in the past, they've burned so much energy. They have burned through so much carbon, you know, carbon-based energies to get to this point. You know, they have developed technologies. Yeah, of course, better technology, you know, better system, comfortable lives. But in what cost? By what cost? They've caused, you know, a big problem to our atmosphere. You know, and I think that they, they should be held responsible for what's, for what's happened. And of course, it's not putting, up them, putting them on a, on a pedestal and say, okay, you're wrong and you should pay us. No, but I think that historically, they should be held responsible for all of these damages. And through how are they going to help the world? I think that you know, they should provide more funds as well as share their technologies and expertise on how to build you know, and slowly transition into these green and, green and cleaner energies. Cities like San Francisco are already you know, slowly, I think around 60% of their energy is coming from renewables. So you know, by sharing their resources, especially you know, to really, really behind countries like Africa, you know, they, can, they, they can skip through the carbon phase and go straight to, straight to renewables, which I think is a good thing. So what can we do and what can we learn from all of this? Well, I feel that as a youth right now, someone who is young, I feel that as an individual, I'm powerless you know, to stop, to influence the government, to what are they going to do? But I think through collective effort, you know, through people, you know, telling each other about, you know, how severe this problem is going to be, you know, and it's about creating that awareness in people that, you know, government can suddenly, that the government can prioritize, you know, getting this done. So, you know, as, as a precaution, I think that people, especially us, we should, you know, read up, you know, on these issues and really understand, really understand, you know, these problems from different standpoints, you know, politically, environmentally, scientifically, so that in the future, you know, we are capable of helping to solve this problem. So I'd like to end my presentation here. I'm so sorry for taking up too much time. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Hiren. Due to insufficient timing, we'll have to skip Hiren's q and session. If any of the participants have any questions, you can direct these questions to him later on through Telegram. Next up, Let's welcome Mu Yen Hong Ming Tu to give her presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Min Tu from Vietnam. I'm currently studying in Lawrence Esting School and today I will present to you guys about a topic called the youth per per perspective. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, first of all, I want to share to you guys about the content today that I'm sharing. First, we would like I would like to conduct a survey. Second up, we will look at the statistic collected, and third up, some suggestions. And lastly, a Q and A section if I have enough time. So, uh, about the youth perspective, I chose this kind of topic because apart from the uh, spreading the awareness and environment issues and other things, I want to know about 
like how can we as youth we can do something that is like clear and what action can we take at the moment and for a long time uh, later on. So first up, uh, I would like you guys to scan this QR code and then we can do a little survey, please. I hope we can finish this survey in like three minutes. All right, uh, I can see here that the survey needs my permission to enter. So um, let's see. Wait a minute. Can I stop sharing, please? All right, so we have a few problems. So like, uh, is it okay if I share the screen of my form and then can you guys type your answer in the uh, chat box, please? All right, so here is the questions. If you have any other problems, please just uh, type it on. When, when you guys finish it with the three first questions, please tell me so I can like scroll it.
All right, I would like to move on to the next questions. Is it okay if I continue scrolling up now? All right, so here are the last questions. Okay, since there is not much time left, I would like to stop sharing since screening. And then we will move on to the statistic. Uh, since that we all just type it on in the chat box. So here I can see that there are many people who are answering the problems that I just, the questions. Okay, so I can see here that you guys want to make a change on climate change and some say like animal rescue too. And also a one person say pollution too. And for the uh, question about how are you guys gonna do that? You guys want to join an organization and want to make change to, to the society. Some say also say like freelancing too, and uh, the amount of time you guys need to like make an impact is like expecting in five to ten years. That is a lot of time, I guess. But okay, let's move on. All right. Can you guys see the screen? Okay, so uh, from this survey, I hope that you guys can outline a plan for yourself to do, uh, to make an impact on the society and also to rescue the environment in the next years later on. And from the survey, I conducted by five elements, uh, which is the uh, survey is made from what, why, where, when, and how. And I hope that you guys can use these elements to put out a plan for yourself too. So with those uh, answers, I here are my predictions for the next 20 years. I hope that we will become more serious than ever about the inside of ourselves and there is like our mental health and by that we will more be more conscious be more aware of the things that is like on the environment and the energy that we are using right now will be turned to into a renewable source as there are will be more investment put into this field and another positive uh prediction is that we will be the generation that fix the problems that are occurring now and furthermore, as there are many negative uh, consequences too. But however, uh, our generation, I believe is the generation that we can change everything. And by that, I could say, I would like to say that we can change it by now, not waiting to the 10 or even 20 years later to make an impact. So I would like to share some suggestions uh, that I have researched. So first of all, please get to know Metronome. 
a warning alarm that you guys might see on TikTok or on social media platforms before. It is a clock uh, before, but now it is like a countdown alarm for global warming. Next up is Ecosia. Ecosia is a platform that we use to search, but along with searching, we can plant a tree and by that, it might contribute a little effort to do the fix the problems of deforestations and furthermore. And also an app called Forest. So as we as students, we can do some research or like when we are studying, we can just turn off our phone and then open Forest. That is the way that we can study leaving our phone and also help to plan the, and build back the environment. And maybe that's all. If there's any questions, please just uh, raise up your hand. All right, thank you so much, Mintu. Due to time constraints, we won't be having a and a session. I'm super, super sorry for that. Let's move on to our next presenter, which is Liana Binti Muhammad Rafis. Hi everyone, my name is Liana and I'm 16 years old and I come from SMK Damansara Utama. Please allow me to share my slides. Okay, so I hope that you guys can see my slides. So hi everyone, today I'll be presenting a topic more specific towards big corporations and their, and their significant role in polluting our environment. And I'll be going much further in depth into what we can do to change uh, things from the bottom up, i.e. from how we can change societal attitudes to reflect in our parliament. So. I want you guys to like kind of survey the images here and see do you guys notice and or like recognize any of these brands that you go that you buy on a daily basis if you accompany your mom to the grocery i'm sure you're seeing these things or even bought these things on a daily basis so i'm pretty sure you guys know coca-cola maggie pepsi and i'm pretty sure you guys all love them right you have to like to drink them and consume them but a stark reality or uh, unfortunate reality behind these companies is that some of them are really pollutive and engage in really harmful acts towards the environment that go unfettered in the status quo. So what do I mean by this? Let's take a look, let's take a look at the statistics of a few things. Firstly, how just 100 companies have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988, just 100 companies. And more than 50% of the world's industrial emissions can be traced back to just 25 companies. And lastly, how a four degrees increase in the global average temperature is estimated if, the comp if companies continue their rate of pollution. So li linking it back to the photo that I've, showed, I've shown to you guys in the first slide, Coca-Cola has polluted 3,000 3, plus pieces of plastic, followed by PepsiCo with 5,000 and Nestle with 8,000. And those are significant numbers that actually cause millions of aquatic animals to die being trapped in plastic bottles and, and bags. It has caused like floods to uh, ravage neighborhoods. And we have to do something about it because people stress on individual responsibility, which is not wrong, but we also have to be wary of corporations who also play a major role as an environmental polluter. So it also has hit close to home, where, for example, I'm sure many of you guys have heard of Sina Kim Kim in Johor, where 2,000 people fell sick and 111 schools were shut because of toxic substances being released into the river. And it has also been seen in, in like other instances in Sungai Patani with like an illegal smelting factory releasing toxic waste, Nestle, etc. So the problem is not foreign to us as climate change 
transcends borders and you and no matter how much we are ignorant to it now we will never be able to escape from it in the future so what are the main factors of this uh, uh, um, happening locally and on a global scale so first is due to the lack of accountability where it is often caused by state institutions falling prey to lobbying and corruption and bribery by big pollutive corporations, but they oftentimes prioritize the economic well-being over potential gains of like, uh, like saving the environment, which is sometimes considered very nebulous like uh, among society. So they would likely prioritize short-term gains of like the environment of the economy growing and developing over environmental change, which may not may or may not be so pressing at that moment of time. The second reason would be to, due to the lack of awareness, where consumers who are environmentally unconscious are the ones driving a, a cyclical problem of environmental degradation, of purchasing products which are not environmentally friendly, but they just do it because, hey, like I don't really care about the environment. I just want to purchase this really expensive H&M shirt. And I don't think environment, the environment degradation will ever affect me in the future. That's, a lot, that's how a lot of us think. So those are the two main reasons why this big corporations can continue to pollute um, unfettered. So what does the future look like? Well, I'm pretty sure past speakers have already like well, well illustrated the future for everyone in this forum already. So I'll just briefly say it. It's bad because if you look at the amount of trash on the beach, if you look at... Um, your home getting ruined by floods, I'm pretty, all, I'm pretty sure I don't need to explain it. Or at least my, the past speakers have already touched on it. So how can we turn the tables as what we want to do in sales 2022? So we think, I think the first step that we need to take is a bottom-up change in society, where the meaning of a bottom-up change would be society, societal attitudes changing, which is then reflected in our laws, right? So if consumers are the ones who create demand for products that degrade the environment, then companies will continue doing it insofar as they make a profit. So what we need to do is that people who are aware of the env environmental degradation need to organize protests or more education in schools. We already do that, but we can do integrate it to a better, to a more larger scale, i.e. having a whole subject on an or of environmental studies or civic education. It could also look like awareness campaigns where we have um, I'm pretty um where we have like the Club Pinchinta Alam or um Sahabat Alam in Malaysia, plenty of NGOs that carry out these campaigns and protests of course to rally support and collectivize action against the government. These are all things that we can do as individuals on the bottom. And what is the next step then? Because we have environmental awareness, we think this leads to a more a, a trend of ethical consumerism. It means consumers demanding greener goods and companies shifting corporate their models, their profit models to cater to those green, green, well, green needs. For example, Apple, which has pride, which which um, is very environmentally friendly, in which they were they pledge to get rid of plastics packaging. And by 2020, by 2020, by 2030, they will be carbon neutral. And yeah, they have they have almost no plastic in their packaging. And we, I think this also has also led to a rising awareness on greenwashing. If anyone doesn't know, greenwashing is the act of companies um, pretending to be green, but they actually are not. This looks like Volkswagen, which produced like 40 times the amount of emissions from their cars compared to a normal diesel car, even though they, they, and they kind of cheated their way out of emissions tests. Or H&M, greenwashing their fashion and like actively engaging in fast fashion, which contributes, contributes a lot of emissions to the environment. So I think there has been a lot of awareness and we can continue to raise awareness to, to be able to boycott these kinds of companies who engage in these things. 
And then I think the last thing would be environmental protection through concrete legislation, where we can elect pro-green politicians into the office to create to craft binding environmental laws that hold co companies accountable for their actions. Um, like Kieran said, like the Green New, the sorry, not Green New Deal, the Paris Agreement is non-binding. NDCs are not binding, but laws are within your own state, right? So how we can tackle this problem is by actually electing people who represent the interests of green of green movements or green of green ngos in order to actually legislate changes to make sure that the government oversees pollution uh, the control of pollution um, and to curb it to the best of its ability and if you can see here the top 10 list of the least pollutive um, companies oh sorry countries would be um, Puerto Rico, Finland, Bahamas, Australia, in which they have very strict regulations being placed on big corporations that, curb, that cap their emissions and toxic waste release. And I've also given to you like a few examples of activists, like um, I, I'm pretty sure all of you guys know Greta Thunberg, who advocates strongly for environmental change. We can be we can be those people in the future, too. So. Lastly, our, our COP26 goal, which I think all of us are aware of, it was to, keep, to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 and keep global warming below um, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Can we do it in 20 years? Yes, we can. <laughs> I believe that we can, we, can, we can change how the future is through collective action and through people protesting, raising awareness and bringing these issues up into the higher ranking um, uh, parts of society, like the government, in order for them to enact change. And I think that is a step-by-step -step and gradual process that we will reach to and that we can further, in, uh, further pursue upon in the near future. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Liana, for that wonderful presentation. Now it is time for a QA and e session. Anyone would like to ask a question? Uh, yes, I have a question for Liana. Uh, okay, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for such descriptive presentation today. Um, so I have one question that I'd really like to hear your opinion on. So despite some green politicians already being in power in some countries like in the US, the government is still unable to pass major legislative change to combat climate change. So why do you think this is the case? Hi, Amira. Thank you so much for your question. So, okay, I would just use, for example, the situation in the US as to answer my question. So. There are, a lot of, there, are, there are green politicians in the government, right? But opposition to green laws are often framed as a matter of cost and the economy, where it'll be like, they, they will be like, oh, it's too expensive. We can't afford green technology and our jobs, security will all plummet. But we think the I think I think at least the price of not enacting any form of legislation is staggering because because climate change will happen either way. It will cause flooding, it will cause tornadoes or whatever natural disaster you want to, you want to name, and it will continue to, to deal damages. So do we, would we rather build a, a billion watt flood, flood walls that will never end to the point in which Earth is uninhabitable? Or should we actually invest in a long-term solution that might be maybe... Um, maybe a bit costly at first, but bring a lot of long-term benefits in the future. Like people will complain about having not enough jobs, right? But I believe that while 2. Like 2.2 million fossil fuel jobs will be lost, it will be replaced by double the amount of permanent clean energy jobs. So it's a transition process that is necessary, but will always be extremely beneficial in the future. So I hope that answers your question. All right. Thank you so much, Liana. Now we welcome Sarah Amira to give her presentation.
Thank you, Danya. Please allow me to share my slides. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good evening to the respected teachers, brilliant delegates, and the supporting audience. My name is Sarah Amira binti Mama Azman, the student representative of SMKP3 Aman here in Malaysia. First and foremost, I would like to thank the sales committee for giving me this opportunity to participate in this year's forum event. It is an honor to be able to share my topic today. From the wide selection of topics to discuss regarding the world's future, I have chosen to conduct a research about Malaysia's waste management and to predict what are the outcomes for Malaysians if we don't control our waste disposals responsibly. The title One Man's Trash Disrupts Our Treasure indicates that it takes just one person's selfish act to alter the course of our environment permanently. Therefore, in my presentation today, I will be talking about the data of waste disposal in Malaysia, the current waste management, as well as my suggestions to improve its waste management. Lastly, I would like to close my presentation today with a take home message. So starting off with the introduction, there are a few factors that can cause the continuous increment of waste disposal. And one of them is being the rapid increase in population and development. So out of all of the waste generated, only 5% of it is being recycled. What does this number mean? This number is severely small compared to the waste being generated. And this goes to show that our country's strategy at managing waste responsibly is still under par. Let me bring your attention to the next slide. So it's an actual fact that Malaysians produce an average of 30,000 tons of solid waste daily. And this buildup can cause in tremendous effects like land and air pollution, as well as cause health problems for communities and also set like a major setback to economic growth. This is because our country's funds would be more invested in processing and getting rid of our waste when it actually should be invested in um, like developing our country moving forward. So now let me bring your attention to the actual data of waste disposal in Malaysia that has been documented. So here I have concluded some information that I found into a graph plot. So this graph shows the waste in tons generated daily by Malaysians ranging from the year 2018 to 2022. So in 2018, uh, Malaysians have generated a total of 36,843 tons in that year. And this number has increased another 600 tons in 2019, another 600 tons in 2020, and the number keeps increasing until we've reached our highest number, which is this year, almost 40,000 tons of trash. So if we were to look at this number in a more visual way, imagine the country's most famous tourist attraction, our Petronas Twin Towers. And imagine just how tall it is. 30,000 tons of trash is actually able to fill the entire building every seven days periodically, which means if you were to get rid of the trash after filling it up one day, there will still be enough to fill it for the rest of the week. So this is quoted actually in a journal clip that I have extracted. And you... Another part of this journal clip also states that every year, globally, an estimated of 1.3 billion tons of waste is collected worldwide. And this number is expected to increase to 2.2 billion tons. This data goes to show that Malaysia isn't the only one having to deal with a severe waste management issue. In fact, the same issues are faced all around the world. Now, let's move on to my next point of today's presentation, which is the current waste management in Malaysia. In this subtopic, I would like to give you a glance at what our current waste management in our country looks like. So, starting off, there are a few organizations out there that function to manage specific type of waste. Um, so, I've only chosen to pick clean waste and alum flora as an example of those type of organizations.
So Clean Waste is an organization that specializes in handling hazardous material that comes from places like hospitals, laboratories, and also clinics. These wastes are dis uh, disposed in yellow bins that are labeled as hazardous material, and they are also separated from general waste. The way to get rid of this kind of waste is by incinerating it in their specialized machines. Alam Flora, however, is more catered towards their uh, waste management of the public. These images shown to you is actually Alam Flora's garbage trucks that go around an area or a neighborhood to collect the residents' waste. You can even keep track of when the trucks will come by your specific neighborhood through their website's collection schedule. Moving on, I would like to explain the current status of disposal sites in Malaysia. About a decade ago, our country had 155 operating landfills and 136 non-operating, only 12 sanitary landfills, and that brings up to a total of 303 disposal land sites occupying the lands of Malaysia. On top of that, the waste disposed was in the forms of loose individual disposals, which made the landfills take up a huge area. However, now our country is working towards improving its management. And the proof is that now in the year 2022, our country has reduced the number of operating landfills to only 137 uh, in number. And they have also increased the number of sanitary landfills to 21 operating. I will show to you soon why sanitary landfills are seen as a better alternative of a disposal site to manage waste in Malaysia. In addition to that, loose disposals are now being improvised into more compacted waste. And this makes it uh, save a lot more space of a landfill site and overall makes the waste management well organized. But even having said that, our statistics of waste disposal and management are still not improving. This is because the efforts taken aren't sufficient enough to save us from an environmental disaster. This brings me to my fourth point today, which are my suggestions of solutions to improve the waste management in this country. So, what do you all understand about the term integrated waste management? So it is a system that considers how to manage, how to recycle, and also how to prevent solid waste in the most effective way possible. Let's take a look in more detail of our first point, sanitary landfills. So as I mentioned before, sanitary landfills is a better alternative to the traditional kind. This is because the process of decomposition in a landfill creates the problems that we face. Problems such as dangerous methane gas emissions and uh, contamination of soil and water sources due to leachate. And leachate is actually a secretion of liquid that comes from the waste and it contains disgusting things like bacteria, chemical waste, and hard metals, just to name a few. So how are sanitary landfills different? The structure of sanitary landfills is actually engineered with a methane gas collector. So this collector directs the gas to an incinerator that helps create and convert methane gas to create energy. And the bottom of the sa sanitary landfill is also lined with a special lining that contains the leachate from seeping into the ground, contaminating groundwater, and also contaminating our water sources. In conclusion, sanitary landfills are a much better way to manage waste as it prevents the secretions and the gases released from waste disposed that's harming the environment. Secondly, the three R, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Why is 3R so crucial in our mission towards saving the environment? This is because this method boosts economic activities, it prevents the loss of natural resources, it lengthens the landfill's operating life because the weight of waste that is like staying at landfills are more reduced. And lastly, it also reduces the number, it also reduces the environmental impacts of waste disposal. This method is tried and true, but the hardest to be implemented by the people. 
Why is that so? Actually, 3R is closely related to my next and last suggestion to improve the waste management of the country, which is education and awareness. In this journal clip that I extracted, it's highlighted that all of these issues are stemmed from the unsatisfactory level of awareness among the community towards the environment. And I quote from the Malaysia Environmental Department in 1997, previous studies indicate that the environmental awareness among Malaysians is still worryingly low compared to developed countries such as Japan, Germany, and Denmark. So how do we combat this issue of low awareness? There have been few motions led by the government, such as Go Green campaign, but the government should also encourage and host more international forums, as well as make it a co-curricular activity to learn about the environment. The truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, is that without education and awareness about the state of the environment, there is no drive and no motivation to improve ourselves and the way things are. Now, we have arrived to the last point in my presentation, which is my take home message. Throughout this entire research, I have learned so many things and I hope that I can end the presentation today with a lasting impact on everyone listening today. So, dearest members of the floor, I would like to present to you two options which is if we go on this way, or if we choose to improve the way we live. If we continue with these habits, our global temperatures will continue to rise exponentially, meaning by this year, if we increase two degrees Celsius, it'll increase even more next year. So by, because our global temperatures will continue to rise, our natural resources will also be exhausted or exacerbated. Heat waves are also expected to occur more frequently and with more intensity. So that is a bit of a picture of what you can expect if you want to continue acting the way things are with less awareness and less education about the environment. But if we, can, if we want to improve the way we live, there is actually a single line of hope for the Malaysians here. There's a hope that we can change everything for the better. In this journal clip, we have actually achieved and surpassed our goal of a 22.0% recycling rate back in 2019, when we were expected to only achieve it in 2020. The actual percentage of recycling rate that we achieved was 28.1%, which is higher than the target that we aimed for. And that was a major improvement from our target set in 2018, which was 24.6%. Now, the challenge for us is to reach the recycling rate of 40.0% by the year 2025. It is possible with more focus to the 3R and the continuous improvement of sanitary landfills, we will be able to achieve this recycling rate in that three year period. In conclusion, although it's difficult to predict the future, I believe that the best future that we can predict is the future that we can create. And with that, I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you all so much for your kind attention. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that amazing presentation. Now it is time for a Q&A session. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, I have a question for Amira. So thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, the question would be, what is the point at which you think that a country has succeeded in achieving its goal of proper waste management? Thank you for that great question, Liana. So we have set a lot of targets by the government and also for ourselves, but do we actually know when we have successfully reached that target? So I think a current proof or a present proof that we can see we are slowly moving towards improving ourselves is when the government has achieved it, uh, sorry, when all groups of citizens ranging from the youth to the elderly 
conduct activities such as recycling and reducing their waste and also reusing it in their daily routine without force. This goes to show that the government's technique of encouraging its citizens to uh, better manage their waste has like consisted of all of the age groups, consisting of those who existed before this implementation and also the younger generation so that they can continue in adulthood with this kind of activities. So to summarize, I think the best proof to show that we have succeeded in our mission is when everyone from big to small have conducted the recycling activities and also manage their waste more responsibly. Thank you, Liana. All right, thank you again, Sarah. Our first forum of Sales 2022 has come to an end. First and foremost, thank you to our panelists for providing their insightful views on the topic Earth 20 years from now. Thank you also to everyone who attended this forum. We hope that it has benefited you in some way or another, and we hope to see you in the next session tomorrow, Effects of COVID-19 on Culture. For all the participants, please do stay in the meeting as we'll be taking a quick photo. Stay safe and take care, everyone.